two of my former uh, graduate students and I were interested in the F China's FDI policy. And um, as many of you know, China's FDI policy became um, very controversial in the United States uh, during the Trump administration with the Section 301 case. And in particular, what the US objected to was what they said was forced technology transfer um, that was coming from Chinese ownership restrictions. So in particular, restrictions that required foreign investors um, to form joint ventures with local partners, that being the conduit for technology transfer. Now, um, just, a, just a side note, um, of course, if we go back to the Doha round and look at the WTO website, <laughs> technology transfer was touted as just a great thing that was gonna happen. Um, as a result of uh, the Doha round and technology transfer was viewed as a good thing. Um, so it has become now a very negative thing. Um, and we wanted to look at, at the a little bit of the uh, use of these uh, restrictions and see if they did induce foreign entry. Um, so this is joint work with Yang Liang, who's now at the San Diego State University, and Hongsheng Zhang, who is at um, Zhejiang University. So just quick background. Um, I think everybody's familiar with China's export surge, uh, which really took place between 2001 and 2008. The export growth was highly concentrated by industry. Um, among other industries, of course, the electronics sector just uh, you know, went gangbusters. Um, and the export surge, particularly in sectors where foreign invested enterprises account for a large share of exports. Now, this may be not so well known because, of course, in the famous China shock literature, um, Artur Don and Hansen emphasized the role of Chinese private firms, domestic firms, in the export surge. But if you calculate the growth rates of exports, um, private sector growth rates are faster because they started from a really, really small base. But uh, foreign, exports on foreign ex, ex, uh, invested enterprise grew much faster and larger over the whole period. And so the question is, what led to this explosive growth in FIEs? There's a lot of reasons we might give, including things like um, you know, um, maturation in the product cycle and electronics, uh, IT enabling, offshoring, et cetera. But one of the things we're particularly interested in is Chinese FDI policies. China began using policies to uh, shape its FDI inflows. Oh, yeah. Before I say that, just let me say this is to convince you that FBI share of exports is particularly is very important. We see even by the year 2000, um, about 45% of China's exports were coming from FIEs. Many, as you are probably already thinking, are coming from uh, export processing zones. They are processing exports to a large extent. Um, that just continued to grow up until the global financial crisis. Um, and uh, in fact, for the US by 2009, uh, about 68% of the exports from China to the United States were coming from foreign investor enterprises. So in particular, importantly, those associated with Apple, uh, because that's such a large part, but also Samsung, other companies besides Foxconn, obviously. After the global financial crisis, the FIE share of exports does diminish a bit. Private sector firms, which have been entering at a very rapid rate into the Chinese uh, sectors, uh, begin to grow, their exports begin to grow faster. But to this day, uh, FIE exports to the United States uh, are more than 50% of the of China's exports to US. Okay, so many countries shape inward flows as did the Chinese. Um, we see similar patterns in other countries. Uh, we have forbidden sectors, for example, in petroleum is a common one or other types of energy. Um, we have restricted sectors. Many countries have restricted uh, FIE inflows, particularly um, the establishment of wholly owned foreign enterprises um, in automobiles. Um, there it's always an important sector for countries. They want technology transfer that they think will come through JVs. 
Um, and then th many countries use preferential treatments, for example, tax holidays, but also many other forms of treatment. In China, tax holidays were widely used, but also many policies that reduce the fixed cost of entry. This would include, of course, preparation of um, industrial parks, so having roads, sewers, et cetera, ready for the company to um, build a factory, um, outright subsidies to build a factory, uh, special training programs to prepare workers, preparation of dorms for workers, et cetera. Um, all of these preferential treatments, at least in China, are typically deal specific. We have very little information on exactly what companies get. There was, the veil was uh, removed a little bit for Apple in a New York Times expose about a decade ago. It spoke about enormous uh, benefits for Foxconn, including many of the policies I've just mentioned that reduce the fixed cost of establishing a new plant um, in China. Okay, so is Chinese FDI regulation different than these common, commonly used tools? And the answer is really no but China is relatively restrictive. And um, WTO members agree not to impose trade-related investment measures, which China claims to adhere to. Um, but there were also special agreements in China's accession protocols not to condition investment approval on technology transfer. And the part of the 301 case is the assertion that China had violated these uh, uh, protocols by conditioning the approval of investment on uh, technology transfer, in particular by forcing foreign investors to form a joint venture with a local partner. Um, okay. So if we just look at the FDI restrictiveness index, this is the OECD 2016. I just put this big arrow over China, and you can see that China is, among all countries, quite restrictive. If you dig deeper into the various um, elements that form this index, you will see that it is mainly due to JV restrictions. They have a very high weight uh, for China in this particular uh, index. Okay, so just to give you an idea, which sectors in China were restricted, and then which were freed. We're going to look at the liberalization that took place in the context of China's accession to the WTO. So part of the negotiations that China undertook, um, especially with the United States and the EU prior to entry, um, involved uh, promises to liberalize sectors and in particular to remove ownership restrictions. Um, I will say right off the bat that they also have what are called encouraging policies. These are these preferential deals that I talked about a minute ago, and no promises were made regarding what we call encouraging policies. You may think of them as also just preferential deals. So just take a look at this list. You can see that prior to 2002, there were many of the familiar things that you might expect. China was restricting that it wanted to create its own indigenous capacity in it such as uh, television equipment, telecoms, auto parts and accessories, uh, chemicals. These are all sectors that were liberalized in 2002. Um, there were others that were restricted until at least 2007 and some beyond. Um, some of them have still not been liberalized, uh, such as medical, surgical, veterinary equipment, um, things like construction equipment and lifting equipment, things where the Chinese have themselves become competitive, uh, tires, vehicle tires, uh, various uh, fibers and chemicals. So there is quite a diverse set of things that were protected through uh, ownership restrictions and then a set of things that were liberalized afterward. We're going to do a difference in differences uh, analysis. And of course, one of the main concerns we have is whether this these industries were chosen endogenously by the government. Clearly, there must be some aspect to that. But many of them were particularly requested by their trading partners. We might think they were things that were ripe for investment uh, by foreign uh, uh, investors and therefore a particular interest to the governments that represented those investors. And we're gonna to try to do some things to control for that and see what, see what we get. Okay, so um, 
one of the things I want is just to try to get you to think about FDI policy as a techno industrial policy. Industrial policy has become much more popular to talk about since we started this paper many years ago. Um, there is this um, view, which is ascribed to Barry Norton um, and his co-author, that China used market reforms in technological catch-up to advance its development until 2003. And there's no doubt that China really uh, stayed away from what we might call direct investment in science and technology during the, the key uh, second half of the 1990s when it underwent enormous uh, market reforms, labor market reforms. There was definitely a dramatic reduction in intervention into science and technology, such as direct subsidization uh, related to, to science and technology activities. Um, according to Ling and Norton, this hands-off phase ended in 2003 when China returned to active techno, what they call active techno-industrial policies, and uh, they document the history of these reforms, I mean, these policies and how they change over time, culminating in something you may all be familiar with, which is um, made in China 2025, which became, of course, quite controversial here in the U.S. during the Trump administration. Uh, but that was just really a continuation of policies that began in 2003. Um, but FDI policies can be viewed as a form of techno-industrial policy, and they were used since the opening of China to foreign investment. China actively shaped the type of investment that it wanted, um, and that changed over time, moving toward uh, higher tech and cleaner technology. Uh, and so they actively discouraged certain types of investment, actively encouraged others, and required um, uh, joint venture formation in a subset of those. Um, so Chinese FBI rules categorize sectors by openness to investment. The first is forbidden, where no foreign investment is permitted, uh, armaments, are a good example. Tobacco is another. That set is small and it hasn't changed much over time. So in the last 25 years, restricted is investment by permission and only as a minority shareholder in a joint venture. For some sectors, there are other rules, but this is the primary one. And that list has changed over time. And that's the variation, one set of variation that we use in our estimates. The other is what sectors are encouraged. These are um, preferences that are available on a deal-to-deal -deal basis, and we argue that it's a, along with reducing variable cost reduction by reducing corporate tax rates, it also focuses on reducing the fixed cost of entry. And so it's an entry-inducing um, policy. Investment in all other industries is allowed with no explicit restrictions on ownership. Subject, it's subject to approval, however, above when investments are above a certain size, which is not that, you know, not that high a number. So many investments, say, from the United States would be subject to approval. Um, what do we expect pol these policies to do? Well, encouraging policies, uh, as we argued, typically lower fixed cost of entry and the corporate tax rate, and we expect them to lead to entry by any mode. It's clear that some investors would actually prefer to enter as a joint venture. And advice that was given to foreign investors at the time by, say, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce or uh, uh, consulting firms that specialize in this emphasized to foreign investors that taking a joint a local partner could be advantageous, uh, particularly in terms of knowing the local market or in having access to government procurement. So there are going to be firms that will enter as a JV or as a wholly owned uh, foreign uh, enterprise um, when they are encouraged. Restrictive policies, of course, close sectors to entry as a wholly owned foreign investment. And they're meant to encourage entry uh, by a JV formation. So the idea of restricting policies is really not to hold back investment, it's to shape that investment and channel it into joint ventures with local partners. I would say, just as an aside, that there is um, a recent paper, um, I'm going to miss the site, it's Wolfgang Keller is one of the authors, that shows that the um, the technology transfer as they measure it 
to um, local firms is, is larger, significantly larger when a foreign investor enters as a JV than when it enters as what we call WUFI or a wholly foreign owned enterprise. In other words, the Chinese aren't crazy. It does appear that the, for, the technology transfer to local firms is larger with the JV formation. Now, um, just to tell you about the policy change here, the vertical line is at 2002. And these are the share of sectors that are affected by various policies. The blue is encouraged. We see about 23% about of sectors are encouraged. These are four digit uh, Chinese industrial code sectors. Um, and that number jumps up dramatically when at the, at the uh, time of uh, WTO accession, Chinese WTO accession. It is consistent with the decrease in restrictions Restriction, restrictions fall from about 15% of sectors to about 5% of sectors. So it's quite a dramatic change. The catalog that guides FDI restrictions changes again in 2007. We see only a, a slight reduction there, the number of sectors that are restricted, and again, an increase in the number of sectors that are encouraged. We do have, therefore, a time-varying um, treatment, um, and we do uh, use techniques to try to deal with this. We also will look just only around the years uh, of the 2002 change. Okay, um, we, just looking at this familiar graph, which some of you may have seen before, it looks at the share of foreign investment that enters either as a wholly foreign owned uh, enterprise or as a joint venture. And you can see that prior to 2002, which is here, there is some pre-trend. So the share of investment that's entering FDI uh, China as a wholly foreign owned uh, subsidiary is increasing uh, even prior to this removal of restrictions. And then of course the trend basically continues until it sort of flattens out um, after 2010. But we don't know what's causing this. One of the things may be more entry in sectors for which there are no restrictions. That would produce this pattern. Um, so we want to see um, if this change in 2002 does affect entry. So our research questions are, did encouraging policies induce entry? And if so, by what mode? Uh, JV or as a wholly foreign owned enterprise? Did they encourage entry of exporting firms? And how much did encouraging policies raise exports? So basically, how much did these policies contribute to China's export surge? Did restricting policies, restricting policies now, restricting ownership share, induce entry of new joint ventures? That was the goal of the policy. The Chinese government wanted new joint ventures. Did removing the restrictions reduce entry of new joint ventures? And did removing restrictions induce entry of new wholly owned enterprises? One would expect that when the entry restrictions are removed, um, we are to believe that foreign investors do not want to share technology uh, with their foreign uh, partners, and therefore that they would uh, choose uh, to enter with 100% ownership as opposed to uh, less than 50%. I would say there's very few firms that are in between that. So when we look at wholly owned enterprises, they are typically 100% owned by the foreign investor. So there isn't a lot between 49 and 100. What do we do? Well, does a foreign investment activity change when a sector is encouraged or restricted? We're going to compare activity patterns on, over time using differences, differences, difference and differences methods. Um, we are going to look at the activity as being driven by other factors. As you all must be thinking, there are many other things that are happening at this time. Changes in tariff rates, the so-called the granting of permanent normal trade relations, um, other export uh, ta taxes that are have been highlighted by uh, Gerard in the JIE earlier. So we have a lot of other trade related factors to account for and whether we can account for possible en endogeneity. To account for these other factors, we clearly add all these controls to our difference in difference uh, estimates and to control for policy endogeneity, 
our thinking here is that if the sector is right for um, investment, it would also be right for a domestic investment. And so we use entry um, of domestic firms as a control group as well. Okay, which activities do we expect to be in, uh, influenced by the policy? Clearly entry of foreign enterprises into China, entry of foreign enterprises who export, and we wanna look at the export volume of foreign firms. For data, we use the Chinese manufacturing firm census. We restricted to this period, 1998 to 2007, where the firm census is quite good. It does have some drawbacks. It omits the smallest firm. It provides, uh, does provide the number of firms, ownership and export value for us. We also use the FDI policy designations. We coded some of our own. They were virtually matched those that were done by Sheng and Yang in a 2000, used in a 2016 paper in the Journal of Development Economics. And we basically use theirs. Although, as I said, we have um, done our own coding. This, they're virtually the same. Uh, industry characteristics we draw from to the 2004 census, which provides a couple of covariates that we use, including the R&D intensity of sectors and the skill intensity of their workforce. Tariffs, export taxes, non-tariff barriers, and PNTR gap are all drawn from other researchers. Okay, so here's the basic difference and differences approach. Our dependent variable is the log of our uh, object of interest. It is primarily the number of firms that enter in a year, um, but it, it may also be the number of um, entry of firms that export in their first year and um, just export volume. The key variable are whether zero one and whether the industry or the sector is encouraged. Again, these are four digit sectors. There is some noise here because maybe not all activities within that four digit are encouraged, um, but it is clearly the best that can be done given that the catalog is text-based. It, it is not given in, in um, a Chinese industrial codes. They have to be matched. And then of course, restricted sectors. And those are sectors, those are when an industry contains restricted items in the catalog. And then of course we have industry and year fixed effects. Uh, we also use it, sector specific uh, year uh, trends as well in some specifications. Um, we do of course look at whether what's going on with pre-trends. Um, here you see just the pre-trends, the blue is the encour uh, encouraged um, and we don't see any pre-trend between those that are encouraged versus not encouraged. And the red is for restricted sectors. And again, we don't see a pre-trend. We do see, however, just in the basic um, event study analysis, we do see the increase in entry of encouraged sectors following the 2000. And this is actually the policy year here. For these, we have two policy changes, one in 2002 and 2007. If we restrict this just to the years before and after 2002, so during that 2002 catalog, we see exactly the same pattern. Um, similarly, for the number of exporters and then for the number of uh, FIE exports. Okay, our baseline table. Now we have three panels here uh, matching up to each of our three dependent variables. Panel A is looking at the number of firms, uh, which is um, gonna uh, look at entry. And what we see is that encouraging increases the number of foreign invested enterprises that enter. And we divide those FIEs up into two groups, joint ventures and wholly foreign owned enterprises. And we see that encouraging policy leads to entry by all by both of these two forms. When we look at restrictions, we see that the only thing that pops or seems to have any significance is the fact that restriction reduces the entry of, of wholly foreign owned enterprises. That's obvious uh, because it is a mandate or a ban on them in some activities within each sector. However, it's interesting to see that the removal of these strict restrictions does lead to the entry of wholly foreign owned enterprises, which implies that the restriction is preventing entry by foreign investors who do not want to have a 
local partner. I think equally as important is this non-significance for JVs. We find no evidence that the restrictions actually forced investors to enter as JVs. They consistently have no response to restrictions in our data. We find similar patterns for the number of exporters and for the um, export values, except we uh, lose significance here on encourage policy as we do up here, which we found up there. Let's complicate things a little bit by adding in all these con trade controls. I can tell you we don't list the coefficients on the, the trade controls, but the only control that really seems to matter is the PNTR gap. I mean, there's a lot of theory about uncertainty, but I'm always shocked at how resilient this, this uh, factor is in looking at entry and exporting in China. Um, but it doesn't affect our coefficients at all. So basically, if you look across the three, and here I, I point your attention just to columns three and four and five and six for joint ventures and for, uh, entry of wholly foreign-owned enterprises, you'll see that encourage, encouraging policies do lead to entry, restricting policies do deter entry by uh, the means of wholly foreign-owned and it seems to have no effect on entry by JV. This is just summarizing our coefficients between the baselines and controls. It's basically reporting what I, I just uh, said. When we then add industry-specific time trends, we again preserve the main results. Uh, one thing that does change is that the restriction now has a negative sign on JVs. This suggests that restrictions significantly detour entry by JV. Um, it's consistent with the finding that restricting the sector is not effective in um, inducing investors to enter as a joint venture. Um, the last thing I'm going to show is triple differencing using domestic firms as controls. Um, so this is we marshalling just a lot of data here to um, try to take account of the fact that maybe the Chinese government is opening up sectors where they believe that domestic competitors will be able to withstand the competition uh, from foreign firms operating. And we do lose some significance in the effect of restrictions on wholly owned. Um, in the entry, but not for entry of exporters or for export values. And in, in encouraging policy still has a positive effect on JV entry and restriction still has no effect on inducing entry. Okay, so just to account for sort of the um, criticism about time varying treatments, we just look at to the period around 2002. So 2019 to 2006, before and after the change in the catalog in 2002. And a pretty quick scan shows that the only difference here is, again, we lose some significance on encouraging policy, influencing the entry of wholly foreign owned, um, but definitely affecting JVs. And again, restriction, restricting policies is significant, restricting the entry of wholly foreign owned, but having no effect on JVs. So the picture that emerges is that they are using encouraging policy to get the outcome that they want, which is they want JV entry and the restrictions are effectively deterring entry um, by uh, wholly owned foreign investors, investments. Um, here we just see if there is um, a response that's different by some measures of how technologically advanced the activity is. Um, and we're using Chinese uh, industry characteristics here, so R&D intensity and skill intensity. Um, and um, we do find, and the, the theory here or the argument here is that it's investors who are more, most concerned about you know, giving away the recipe for the secret sauce who are going to be most affected by restrictions. Um, and we do find that... Um, Particularly for restrictions, the more R and D intensive sectors are even more like are deterred to a greater extent in entering. Um, and similarly, down here when we use skill intensity, 
Other than that, the results are mostly the same, except we continue to get the effect that restrictions de defer or deter entry by joint ventures. The magnitudes uh, appear to be large, um, but not so large when we look at trade flows. It raises the number of foreign enterprises by about 14%, that is encouraging policies. Um, it raises the number of foreign exporters by about the same, but it only raises the value of exports from foreign invested enterprises by 2.4%. Um, and part of this is that many of these sectors that are encouraged uh, do serve the domestic market. So they have a higher uh, share of domestic sales to export sales. Um, and these are really, here we're being very conservative, only using the coefficients that are significant in our baseline. And so these are, these are new joint ventures. So FDI promotion policies induce activity um, beyond that incurring in the domestic sector. And it's happening through this entry of joint ventures. When we look at ownership restrictions, we do find that removing these restrictions as uh, China foreign partners wanted at its time of its accession does lead to the, um, uh, this, is, this is in the negative, it limits them, but it, removing them raises the number of FOEs who enter by, uh, WUFIs that enter by 15% and raises the value of their exports by about 6%. We find no significant activity on entry uh, or export activity of joint ventures. Um, so removing the restrictions induces entry beyond that occurring in the domestic sector. When we look just at magnitudes very quickly, you see it's very different by sector because, of course, the policies differ by sector. Um, the sectors which were most affected uh, were at the bottom here, chemicals, transport equipment, um, beverages so it's a it's a it's a even um shoes hats and clothing so it's kind of a mixed bag it's not all high tech um by any means and um, it includes both by encouraging jvs and opening up sectors to uh wholly owned foreign investment when we look at the composition of china's exports um we have a counterfactual based on our estimates partial equilibrium estimates and the actual we see that it they the policies did skew China's um, exports more towards so-called high tech. We get more entry of things in electronics, for example, um, and it uh, decreased the sec the share of exports that are coming from labor intensive sectors, uh, such as apparel, textiles, shoes, hats, toys, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, just to finish up, does it matter? Force technology transfer is a major complaint against China by the US, but also now by the EU. Um, and the main instrument that, it, that uh, is allegedly forcing the transfer are these uh, requirements for JV partnerships. We find no evidence that ownership restrict, restricts induced JV entry. Um, instead, it just defers uh, entry by wholly foreign owned. Um, I will say that there are many studies which find that um, Fully foreign owned enterprises are um, higher, have higher productivity. Um, so they may not uh, result in as much technology transfer to local firms, but they are in some sense better firms. Um, so you are deterring uh, entry by firms which are raising productivity. Um, FDI preferences induce entry by JVs. We can't say how much of this is a quid pro quo. Um, it's, Effective in, effective in inducing entries. It's highly likely that as China removed restrictions, um, uh, they increased the um, preferences. So instead of using a stick, they use a carrot. We can't control your ownership share, but we can uh, make it sweet for you to come in in a particular mode. So I will leave it there and hope that we get some comments. Thank you.